We knew the Guardians were going to set their opening day roster over the weekend. We did not know how they were going to get there. We'll talk about the surprising move to move on from Miles Straw. What's next for him? Who benefits the most from it? We'll break down all the impacts of the decisions for the opening day roster for the Guardians on today's Locked On Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians. Your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. We have a fun one. There's so much going on. But first, I have to say that today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. New customers join today, and you'll get $200 in bonus bets. If your first bet of $5 or more wins, visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get started. I want to thank you for making LockedOn Guardians your first listen today and every day, wherever it is you get podcasts. I am Jeff Ellis. I used to be the lead draft and prospect analyst at Scout and 24-7. I've been on a million and a half drive time radio shows. And I used to write about prospects for just about every Cleveland blog. There was. I'm Justin Latta. Uh, before I came to the co-host of Jeff at lockdown guardians, I covered the guardians Indian farm system for a number of outlets. I was the managing editor of Indian slash guardians baseball insider from 2018 to 2022. I have my own newsletter now. And I also write about prospects at prospects live and do some freelance work on the guardians with the Rain Morning Journal and the News Herald up here in Cleveland. It is Jeff's favorite week of the year. Besides the draft, because it's the end of spring training and the start of real baseball there, and it should be everyone's favorite week because spring training, I will say, Jeff, I'll, I'll give you this. It was long. I feel like this was the longest spring training ever, and this is somebody who went to three games and was excited to be in person instead of being back here in Ohio and in the cold and watching on TV when the guardians allowed us to watch on TV or ballets, I should say. Um, but it was a long spring training. This was a very long spring training. Well, the funny like. thing is, it is it's long, but it's short. Like it, it's, and for the so box, 30 spring training games, I, I know, but that's, that's but guess what? It, it is, but 30 is also a small sample size. Like um, it, it, that's why I say it's a lot, but it's short because it's, again, it's there. It, spring training is not there for the hitters. It's, it's, it's for the pitchers. It's, it's it's not about the size is. of the sample. It's about no. The, never mind. That's that's another joke. Never no, mind. Let's, that's, let's not go there. <laughs> but like it, it's interesting. We're gonna get into all of it today. But it's like technically the two best offensive performers didn't make the team, and Estevan Florio, who scuffled, did. And the best quote I saw on this, um, a very smart gentleman made, and I'm gonna paraphrase it, which was essentially like, nothing a guy does over a month and a half is going to change a team's view that has years of data on them. Now that paraphrasing is from a quote a tweet by you uh oh. so but that, that, that that's what be right then that, that can't be right that, that's essentially what we're seeing here it's like people and, and i know people are like oh jeff with this dead horse but it's because i've been spending the last 10 years sitting here being like spring training stats don't matter like they've Carlos never Carrat, mattered they've never mattered uh, but i'm saying like I, I i pulled out tweets i was tweeting about this for that and i get yeah. people people get mad at us or the show or the the baseball team it's like Guys, no one skips levels in the minors. Like Delauder and Manzardo, Manzardo had a, a bad year. That's why Cleveland got him. Like, let's be honest. Statistically, it was not a good year for him. It's not like he had necessarily guaranteed a spot coming in. Now, you could argue that he's probably the best candidate. First, in terms of Delauder, that, that was never even in the cards. And, and people get mad about this stuff. And it's it's silly because this stuff doesn't matter. Nothing that happens in a month and a half is going to change a year and a half of, wise. Yeah, it's not going to change the year and a half of data. Like very little gets it's one proven or done in camp. I mean, Carrasco didn't necessarily have the best camp. But Carlos Carrasco, if we based everything on spring training, should have never pitched in the big leagues in his entire career. Or Brian uh, Shaw. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there are certain guys who just don't do well. And it's it's a it, spring training is long, so pitchers can ramp up. And that's all it is. That's why all these guys who were sick are going to start the year on the DL because they didn't have enough time. It's why Blake Snell, you know, it's why when Jordan Montgomery signs, it's going to take him like six weeks to get to the big league. Yeah, even J.D. Martinez won't be writing. He's a hitter. No. So quickly, let's run through the injuries. If you haven't heard yet, Gavin Williams, obviously going to start the year on the injured list uh, because of the elbow. And he just, you know, he's trending back in the right direction. He's throwing out to over hundred feet again. So he just needs time to build up his endurance, get again, ramp up to five innings, a hundred pitches, whatever. So he's going to need time to do that, but things are all trending in a good direction for him. 
Same for Sam Hentges. He'll start the year on the injured list. He needs time to build up as well, but things are trending in a good direction with for him. Xavier Curry and Ben Lively, we did, really didn't account for, but they caught the illness late in camp, and they ran out of time to build up as well, so they're doing the same things. We'll see how it goes with them. They they need uh, they'll have to make some decisions when those guys are finally ready. They then all these guys should be back maybe by the end of April, maybe get maybe Williams in May, depending on how how much they need to do with him. And then Trevor Stephan in the in the coming days will be placed on the sixty day injured list um, when he gets Tommy John before the end of March. And then the one that's up in the air is James Karinchak. They haven't confirmed anything, but it seems likely he'll be on the sixty day IL. But um, because they're going to create a roster spot with one mile straw and uh, Trevor Stephan don't necessarily need to open that spot. In yeah, and uh, De Los Santos, three spots. Yeah. So we'll get to all that. So they don't necessarily need to create that those spots for two guys, but um, they could choose Karen check on the 15 and then maybe move into the 60. if they need to make another move. Now at this point, you probably should have heard who's on the open day roster. It's Shane Bieber, Tanner Bybee, Logan Allen, the first three games. Then it's going to be Tristan McKenzie in game four and Carlos Carrasco in game five and then the bullpen is class a barlow sandlin just barely made it with he hadn't pitched in a while because of the, the viral illness hunter gaddis makes it tim heron makes it eli morgan makes it tyler Beatty will make it and then kate smith maybe as long <laughs> this is a weird one okay kate you're going to be on the roster if we don't acquire someone yes. who <laughs> you're a fallback at the end of camp yeah what a weird way to be like okay i'm i'm kind of excited but i'm i don't i shouldn't be excited i don't know i'm sure they did in a way that was respectful but it's just just very weird. Um, well, you know, at Naylor, the same time, for a guy who's an undrafted free agent, again, 2020 was a weird, weird draft gear. But still, he would have hey, like, drafted if it was normal. Yeah. If it was weird, yeah, probably would have. But like, undrafted guy to make the big leagues—that's a big story. You know, even if it's a weird, he'll be there at some point. I've got no sound. <laughs> I've done this enough times where I shouldn't be able to put myself on mute. Okay, let's get to the bulk of this. Where, um, let's let's. First, say the Guardians have not officially commented on the fact that Miles Straw reportedly has been placed on waivers. So the Guardians have not said anything yet. However, Zach Meisel has said it, and Mandy Bell has said it, and I think other people have as well. So there's no point in saying um, that he's not because those people aren't putting their reputation on the line for a false report. So he is on waivers, and there was some confusion on this online because a lot. I had someone. <laughs> people I had don't someone understand just, waivers at all. I had someone flooding my mentions after this saying, You're wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. I know how this works. And he, he has to be DFA to be off the roster. So no, technically, technically mile straw. Cause I don't, contracts are definition. guaranteed. Well, there's that. It doesn't, that doesn't yeah. matter. The contract but here doesn't matter but as well. Yeah. Okay. So he has an option. They could have, if they wanted to keep him on the 40 man roster, they could have just optioned the triple a and said, okay, you're in triple a. Now you're still in the mm-hmm. 40. But the reason he they, they bypassed, someone said, you have to DFA him to get him off the 40. You don't. You don't. They put him on waivers, which is the step after DFAing somebody. So they skipped that part, and they're allowing someone to – it's kind of a, a benefit to Miles Straw because this way, if someone did want to pick him up, he could go right to a major league team, and he wouldn't have to go to AAA, mm-hmm. and someone else could pay him the contract. It benefits Cleveland, and it benefits Straw. The problem is no one's going to pick that contract up. And he's not going to refuse his assignment because you you if with his service time, which is a little over four years, he can refuse the assignment because it has he doesn't have five years, he doesn't get the money. If he had five years, he could refuse the assignment and collect the money and go elsewhere and make the league minimum. But because he doesn't have five years, he cannot decline the option and collect the money. So he's gonna he's if he clears waivers like everyone expects, he'll go to triple A. He'll be the a $5 million a year, essentially a player in AAA for Cleveland. He'll be off the 40-man roster. They didn't do this to keep him on the 40-man roster. They did this to get him off the 40-man roster. They did it in hopes that somebody might, somebody else might pay him the money and that he might go get an opportunity somewhere else. I would also assume this is true based on the fact that during the broadcast today, they they the, the Guardian's uh, TV feed showed us Miles Straw sitting next to Chris Hansen, just out in the stands of, of, of the Goodyear ballpark next to each other. They were just sitting in, in, you know, seats with the fans talking to each other, which I was like, that's got to be interesting. Like, if you bought a ticket to today's game and you were sitting in, you know, that section, you could have heard them discuss who knows what. He was just sitting there in street clothes. So we can pretty much confirm this is probably the case. The real question yeah. is, why did they make this move now? And what else happened um, to lead up to this? And who's going to benefit from that? And we need to answer that all coming up on Lockdown Guardians.
before we answer the Miles Straw question, did you pick Baylor? Did you pick Auburn? I did. But I'm not crying about it because you can say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset. I didn't bet on Grand Canyon. I bet on St. Mary's. That was a bad choice. Or one seed. It's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, if you are a new customer, get in. You get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. You can no longer bet on a, a one seed to be a 16 for an easy bet, but you could throw down something else that you consider to be an easy bet. And even if there's not a big payout, you get the $5 bet right, and you get $200 from FanDuel if you're a new customer. You can use that on point spreads, money lines, and you can even pick who is going to win it all. There are still a lot of good seeds left. So just visit FanDuel.com slash lockdown and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. They don't make you cry. All right, Jeff, do you think, okay, why do you think the Guardians decide to make this move now? Because we should say this. You and I both felt like there was no chance they were going to do this. And when we come on here and we say things and we say, you know, this is this is going to happen. This isn't going to happen. Whatever. We do this based on how the team has operated previously. Yes. Like sometimes we are allowed to be part of press conferences and ask questions when the Guardians feel like we're privileged enough to cover the team. Other days they feel like that we aren't worth, you know, the ground that we stand on. Um, so we're not privileged to be Definitely a part of those press a conferences. weird contentious relationship <laughs> with a, with a front office reason. that we that we've been very supportive of, but seem to sure. somehow um, not be very supportive of us. But most of our analysis is based on historical precedents. We can say that. So this is not a move Cleveland has made in the past. When they move a bad contract, it's normally like you know Nick Swisher, and Michael Bourne for Chris Johnson, or they move Josh Bell and they take back Gene Segura. That's how they normally move a contract. They don't eat money like this. Like. They're going to be paying Miles Straw to play in AAA, and they still own 19.25 over the next four years. So I, I don't think anyone's taken that contract, at least not in the, in the, in the short term. But so we we both said they're not going to move on from Miles Straw. Obviously, we were wrong. We didn't have any indication from the team leading up to this that they were going to do this. Um, they certainly didn't guarantee he was going to play regularly. They were going to make him earn that. Then he gets sick, and again, we weren't we're not around the team every day like some of the people. This is a um, a side gig for both of us for the mm -hmm. most part. And um, sometimes we're just not privileged enough to be part of press conferences for whatever reason. But the times we are allowed to cover the team when they think we're worth anything, um, we didn't get any indication that this was going to be the case. I think there's, you know, there's some things that we need to point out here. And I already did one of them. One is like Stroud was having a heck of a spring. Um, he had some <laughs> swing changes. He came in, was arguably Got stronger. Yeah, you know, the number two outfielder in terms of production, because people bring up Cedrella, uh, Lorenzo, Serendola. He's 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 got, he is here to be a fourth outfielder in AAA. I don't know why people are acting like this guy's a world beater. He didn't even have that many at bats in camp. But Straw was great in camp. Uh, maybe the hope was that there'd be a narrative where teams would jump on him. The other thing is, and I felt guilty of this, like, I'll be honest, I got this wrong, is remember like last year when they traded Savale and people were like, oh, the locker room's going to rebel. I think Josh Naylor is pretending to be hurt because he doesn't want to play so he can sabotage his value. <laughs> That's my sub thought on it. But, you know, I thought there'd be some degree of like, oh, they're sending down a vet. But no, like at the end of the day, essentially, I think you need one guy in that locker room who will call a spade a spade and tell someone if they're not doing enough. And that's why they brought in hedges. Um, Straw didn't do it last year. And that's why when Calhoun came in, it was a big enough deal. Straws, I'm always kind of surprised. I mean, I get he was. The funny thing with Straw is you can't be bad. Uh, you can't be bad offensively. Like he was a the best center fielder in baseball defensively, but that didn't matter to people. If he had been a plus bat and an awful defender, he would have been loved. Like the the problem is the the mid to casual fan only sees offense, doesn't see defense. And his bigger issue was last year he wasn't even that defender. So once the I, it felt like maybe his legs weren't as strong a year ago. He didn't steal the bases like he did before. He didn't get to those outstanding plays that allowed his outs above average to be super strong. This is the right move. Don't get me wrong. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. We didn't expect them to eat the money. And I think we can also say like it's time to stop worrying about how people react in the clubhouse because that's not a thing. And I'm guilty of thinking it is. And it's it's clearly not. Um, and again, spring training stats don't matter. I think the locker room thing is 
a a flu- it's it's a fluid thing. I don't think yeah. like I think it matters, but I think there's also like a degree of of where some of the things we think matter don't. And you're right. You have to have somebody in there that can hold people accountable when things get ugly. You know, me and then again, that's why they they felt like they had to bring in Cole Calhoun they did last year because they didn't have that voice. And it's hard to get that voice. Even when you have guys in the team like like Beaver, who's been around for a little bit, and Jose Ramirez, who is your team leader, who is more of a leader by example than he is by word. Um, although he took, you know, Davis and De Los Santos under his wing and tried as much as he could to help him. And reportedly he was the one to, to kind of console him after De Los Santos didn't mm-hmm. make the team. So there's that. Um, but it's it's a fluid thing. It, it changes. Um, you know, it's a very it's a very unique dynamic what goes on there. But I hope what they learn is everybody learns is that you're a professional, you're being paid to do this. And you need to show up for yourself and you need, you need to show up and put the work in that's going to benefit you and the team, because whatever benefits you should benefit the team. Um, if you're, if you're doing something that only benefits you and doesn't benefit the team, then you're doing it wrong and people are going to notice. Um, it is interesting that Steven vote in his first year, like, I don't, I don't think vote being here and, and straw being gone are tied together. Like I don't, I some think to some say, degree, well, Tito, Tito like defended him to the hilt. I think there was still some Tito. He did, back but, but you also got to remember that was Tito's style. Okay, yeah. Tito was never going to call out a player in public. Now I know he did have instances of of what he said about young players. I'll, I'll say yeah. that, but, but but he also was like, remember when they're like, "What well, did you think about pinch hitting him?" No, he gave us the best opportunity to succeed. Like he was one of Tito's dudes. He was, but I think we know the front office probably has a lot more influence over vote than they did. Like. When Tito and, and the front office say they were collaborative, they were both sharing their ideas and finding out the best way to make those ideas work in concert and, and make compromises. I would I'm not gonna sit here and say vote is us as being steamrolled by the front office and they're making all the no, decisions. No, but no. I think I think you can safely say the front office probably has a little more influence on how things are running just because of votes and experience. So but I think he's also you know, fine with that. I think that's I do. No, I do as well. Yeah. But I'm just saying for the people who are going to say, well, if Tito was still here, Straw would be here. I don't think that's true. I think the front office made this call. And, and I, don't know. I think if Tito was, was here, he might still be here. I'll, I'll, but I'll be why, OK, if Straw was a leader in the locker room, it's interesting that you would take away a player. That is a good locker room per- player in it for a guy who, you know, this is his first time managing a locker room. Because so let's be honest. A lot I, of I don't what, even, I don't people even think it's love to criticize. Yeah. People love to criticize what a, what a manager does in games, but really, ninety percent of the time, the only thing you get wrong is is your bullpen moves. Sometimes, most of what you're doing is managing twenty six players in your locker room at a time. So to take away a guy who was an influential locker room guy for a manager in his first year says they're not really that concerned about the locker room. That's no, I don't I think they're say. concerned about the locker room. I just think that you know, Tito showed a year ago that like he believed in straw and I just think that he would have kept believing in straw and, and, and he would have at least been, do you think he would have won the battle to keep it though? Because there yes. was, I mean, I don't, I don't necessarily, I think there's a world think... where Brennan, I, I think that's where Brennan ends up in triple a because of his struggles last year and Tito being like, well, we got other guys in that role. Apparently I'm going to pull my microphone off. Of yeah. My but desk. you're not going to, you're not going to say that Brennan or straw had a better year. They both stunk a year ago. Yes, so I, exactly. I think, so then you go, he goes with his in the bat. battle. Well, we're, th- never gonna, we're never going to know. know. We're, we're just going to have to agree that. to disagree on this one. I, I think that yeah. Brennan's down and Straw is still here if you still have uh, Tito yeah, here. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to disagree on there, but one, the thing is we'll never know that answer. No, we won't. My question, though, is this. The, did the Guardians try to trade Straw? Because, this, I mean, essentially this is them saying, hey, anybody can have him and pay the contract. And, it, like I said, it benefits the team to get out from under the contract. It benefits him from having to go to AAA. He can stay in the majors. Did they try to trade him? Because if this is the move they got to, I'm wondering, like, if they try to call around and say, hey, do you want to take him? And they nobody did. And he didn't it might prove he had no value to, on, on a roster somewhere else. I'm not saying the guy doesn't. You know, I'm not going to sit here and say he's been lively and he's out of options like I always do. But I'm wondering I, if there was any attempt to trade him before they got to the decision to say, because it's, it's a it's a hard thing to tell a veteran player who you signed a contract just a couple of years ago, yeah. who is friends with your best, you know, is with your best player on your team. And uh, as well, like to say, Hey, it might've helped them hey, get that we, contract over the line. That might be the real value of this contract that, that they he, knew that uh, he put yeah, his the on story hold. Was that he backed yeah. up. Yeah. But that, so, you know, that was part of T a uh, part of Jose knowing his friend was getting taken care of. It's easier to sit there and explain it to a player that he's been traded 
rather than hey you're off i mean you're still gonna get paid essentially but well, you're off the 40-man roster and you got to go to triple a and you're gonna have to fight for your way back like it's easier to tell a player you've traded them because that means another team wanted you yeah and you had value somewhere else and hey it was just a numbers game whereas here you're saying sorry we don't think you're one of the best you know six outfielders on our 40-man roster and you're gonna have to fight your way back. Like that's a hard thing to tell somebody. It is. I just wonder if maybe they told him like, Hey, this is happening, but we are going to try and trade you through the DFA process. We're going to try to find you a home. Like they didn't they, DFA him though. They didn't. Or, I mean, that's uh, clear, not DFA waivers. Like, 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 Hey, well, there is no trading now. There is no trading. This is strictly. If you yes, want miles strong, you can, you can, you can claim it. him and take his contract. But, there is no well, return. Can, here. I know, but th- there could be a world. No one's, which no one's going to do, but this could also then open some discussions if there is a situation where a team is going to, hey, you eat this much, or like this could, you know, you could still sell it to him. Like we will still try to find a place for you. Like, you know, we'll see what we can do. We well, can't that's guarantee just if anybody anything. else wants him, though. I know, but I, I don't so think no anyone wants the Guardians him. here. No, it's there never you is. take the 19 and a half million dollars or we eat it and he goes to triple A. That's that's yes. the only two outcomes here. Well, there is a world where teams like, well, we're not willing to eat that much. Like he goes to triple A. You know, like. I don't know. I don't know if that's a rule, though. I don't know if you can do that when a player's on waivers. When he's on waivers, no. After he passes through, I'm saying this might open up teams that, like, if they didn't reach out, like, oh, okay, so he is now. Maybe we can have discussions about. Oh, uh, I see what you're saying. So a trade after he after, gets off the forty, after yeah. he's out right off the roster, yes, I because see. he's already off right now. Okay. A team could add him as as depth as there's a team that's concerned or, or wants you know thinks maybe hey he did swing Cleveland changes pays part of it part okay. of it or or they hmm. send another you know a segura type of deal a bad contract the other way um i could see that okay you know there, hmm. there's a world where that 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 is what i'm saying maybe i'm not explaining it well no like, no no, listen, no I, I've, saying, I've been yeah. sleep deprived uh you know my, my wife just got back today <laughs> after uh, four days of single parenting two kids under six so my brain is not at full strength <laughs> much like right, miles straw's about... power not at Ugh, full strength. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's say he also got sick and that was out of his control. And yeah. that probably didn't help. But this might have been coming either way. Because like we said, yes. spring training stats I definitely matter. All right. Uh, we'll talk about, we pretty much already talked about what's next for Straw. We'll talk about who's going to benefit from this on their team. We'll talk a little about the starting rotation because there's a new member of it, at least temporarily. And of course, we got to get to you no know, Davis and De Los Santos and what that means and why. kind of makes no sense for them to do this, at least in my eyes. We'll see what Jeff thinks. Disagree. Hey, Amazon Fire TV. It's a perfect place to go and watch your sports. Uh, I keep wanting to check this out. I don't have a Fire TV and my Fire Stick is like 10 years old, isn't as strong. But the fact of the matter is you can watch college basketball. I'm hoping college baseball. Uh, you know, you're going to want to watch it on the Fire TV. It is a channel that Locked On is working with right now. And Fire TV created these fire channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos of your favorite sports brands for free. That includes all of us at Locked On, most of the big pro leagues and college conferences. Uh, you can see everyone probably outside the Pac-12, if I had to face a bet out there. Mm-hmm. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all game analysis highlights and more to keep you up to date on all the latest in the world of sports, March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention... Great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, and cooking channels. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. Trust me. To learn more, visit AmazonFire.com slash TV, All one word. And hey, watch us. That makes it fantastic content with that alone. We were disagreeing tonight the most on yeah. anything we have. All right. So very quickly, um, starting rotation we talked about is Bieber. Bybee, Logan Allen, Tristan McKenzie, Carlos Carrasco, barring any last minute changes. And you know, congratulations to Carrasco for making it. It's going to be interesting to see what they do between Carrasco and, and Beatty. And I know people are going to say, well, they got to make some roster decisions when, when Curry's healthy, when Lively's healthy. Curry could go to AAA, honestly, at this point. But yeah. Lively and, uh, and Williams could come back. Henches will come back. They'll have to make some decisions. But let's be honest. Sometimes these decisions are kind of made for them. Like, you know, look at look at the Cincinnati Reds. They had everyone. They signed Jamer Candelaria, and they had a bunch of infielders to start the the, the spring. And everyone's like, "How are they going to play? You know, seven infielders in five spots. How's this going to work?" And then, well, Lee Marte got suspended, and uh, McLean got hurt, and a bunch of guys got hurt, and now they're they had to trade for Santiago Espinal to fill out their roster because they were down yeah. a bunch of infielders. So these things tend to work themselves out. But I hope the best for Carrasco. All right, 
I think it's pretty clear to say that the player that benefits most from Miles Straw being off the 40-man roster is Tyler Freeman. It sure sounds like center field is his to run with at this point because all, all the outfielders on the roster can play center field. Florio can play center. Quan could play center. Loriano, Brennan, and, and now Freeman. But we know and we know shortstop is spoken for with Rokio. We know third base and second base are spoken for, obviously. This frees up Freeman, no pun intended, to play center field. And they said they're going to move Arias around for versatility. To me, Freeman is your center fielder, and you just rotate everybody else through DH. You give everybody else a half day off to DH right now, which we'll talk about in a second. But I think the player that benefits most is Tyler Freeman. He's going to get everyday reps in center field. And I'm excited to see how this goes. I, you know, I know you weren't the biggest believer in Freeman, but I'm very curious to see if he can translate a hit tool into somebody who, who doesn't hit a ton of home runs into being a big league regular and how he, how he transitions to center. Cause as far as spring training goes, he looked good in center field, but we all know what spring training means. So I mean, anyway, no, the, <laughs> defensively, I think there is, you know, it's one of those things that it's that that's probably actually more valuable than the hitting data is the defensive data you get out there. Um, I, I think center field has a good chance to be a platoon with, with him and Florio, a lefty and a righty. I can uh, see that, you know, I, that's just my general view. I think they both benefit. And I think, you know, with, with Loriano and Quan in your corners and that that's kind of where I see it going right now. Um, I, I think, I think Gabby might get a chance to play like five days a week playing random spots all over this team. Uh, I think they still want to see him play. I think the interesting, you know, statement is that Rokio is the everyday shortstop. Uh, and it's interesting from the thing is like Rokio doesn't have that flexibility that Gabby has. Now we know he didn't love being the most flexible guy, but he does have it. So I think there is some value in that, um, as well. I, you know, the shortstop thing, I wasn't going to get very upset one way or another. They're, they're very similarly graded out guys for me. Um, so we'll have to see where Gabby plays, but I, I think it's probably a platoon. I think Freeman and Florial, and I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if they wouldn't say ride a hot hand, but if there's, the, the, the one thing with that, though, is that Freeman's the righty, so he would face a lot less of the, uh, you know, he'd get only 20% of the at-bats. Yeah, I don't think, that's why I don't think it's going to be a strict platoon. Like, I think they're going to, I mean, you're right, Florio probably will get some run early on, but. Because he has more experience. I, I know. Yeah, it's I just, just I just believe in Freeman a lot more than I believe in Florio. I, I just I don't just, know if Freeman, like. I, I don't I, think Florio's last in the whole year. I got to be honest. I just don't. And the thing with Freeman is this is the profile we've talked about with, you know, Owen Miller, with Francisco Mejia, with. It's similar. Sure. You know, this is the same profile. I don't think he's, he's quite Mejia. I think he's a little better than Mejia. I mean, Mejia was the guy everyone loved coming up. He was a top 10. Prospect. Yeah, but 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 Mejia was very was more Mejia to me was more was more like Oscar Gonzalez in terms of swing happy. Yeah, I think Freeman's I mean, got a little more play. He's a little more, but I just don't think there's that secondary tool. Like the swing is never going to gonna get the power. He's not going to walk. So it's all about contact. It's Oscar Mercado esque as well, where it's like, you're putting so much pressure on the hit tool has to yeah. stay impactful. And this isn't a quan level do. of bat control. And it's very hard. And that's why something against him. He seems like a perfectly fine person. Quan walks more. You know, yeah. Quan yeah, does walk more. And, and that provides more value. It's just, it's, it's a profile. I don't like. That's all. It's nothing against the player. It's just when you are sure. hit tool and nothing when it's when it's batting average and nothing else is plus. I just don't see pathways to success. And and Nunzio, I, I appreciate that you listen, but don't start the argument with me on it. It's just that's that's how I view those profiles, and I've always been lower on all of those types. And at least yeah, I'm it takes a unicorn type of player to make yeah. that work. Um, you know, it, you have to be a Vlad Guerrero, basically. All right, so Davis and Dale Santos back in Arizona. They didn't work out a trade. Like I know people are saying, maybe they're going to work out a trade. I just never thought that was going to happen. We, we Why would Arizona want to times. do it? Yeah, there was no benefit. But at the end of the day, I just didn't see how Davis and Dale Santos was going to work. I, I predict they were going to keep him at least to start the year, and I got that wrong. I was pretty close on most of my picks. I didn't get Fry and Dale Santos, and I don't, I don't think anybody got straw, right? But – I just didn't think this was going to be a long-term marriage. I just didn't think there was a way to hide a player like this on your roster uh, for the whole season. Very hard to do. And people were like, oh, well, they did it with Baltimore, did it with Santander. Santander had Tommy John surgery. Yeah. So Baltimore had the benefit of stashing him and then sending in the AAA and, for rehab games. And he so could they, play they, some outfield. And he had experience in the outfield. Like this was a new yeah, thing. There was, yeah. There was, this was a lot of differences for De Los Santos. And he was, yeah, so I just never thought this was going to work long-term. My confusion, though, is, you know, 
I thought these two guys were tied together, Manzardo and De Los Santos. So I thought, well, they sent Manzardo down, so they're going to try to keep De Los Santos on the bench and see what happens. Kind of weird they didn't have Manzardo up. I, I just don't see the benefit. I know people are going to, well, people are going to say like, oh, you know, obviously service time. And I think there is a modicum of service time thing yes. here. But why, why are we worried about Manzardo's age 30 season as a first baseman who is unlikely to be, like if you're talking about Pete Alonzo, yeah, I understand because Pete Alonso I mean, is a 40-home run, middle-of-the-order bat. Manzardo, we think, can hit in the middle of the order, but we don't think he's a 40-home run guy. He's more like a 50-extra-base hit guy, if we're, if we're being honest, um, which is good. He can be a good player. I just don't think he's a superstar. Um, so I don't see the big deal in, in, A, his arbitration value, and, B, his age 30 season as a first baseman, especially the way first baseman age. I just don't see it. I mean, first basemen don't always age the worst. I think there's I think there's a few things to play with this. Um, the first thing is is what they've talked about for a while now, and I think they get to do is they want to have flexi- flexibility with the DH position. Like it's Which going I to do be like, and that's part of it. It's like the first baseman is Naylor. You and I have both talked about the discussion about what that can be like. But even it's like okay, so if we talk about if he's Yandy Diaz, that's the third best uh, by WAR first baseman in baseball a year ago. I mean, he had a higher WAR than Cody Bellinger, and look what Cody Bellinger just you know I, I know positional look you know some of the other guys paul goldschmidt i mean it's there's still expense in getting these type of guys uh, out there so you definitely he's not going to win rookie of the year first base would never win it it would be no. almost it, it would almost be you know malpractice to have him up to start the year so have him down for a month and at the same time you know i'll just keep going back to it he had an up and down year there was a lot going on it's it's not a slam dunk situation why not slowly let him work his way in and up um you know I, if he had started the year with the team I, I that there would have been a logic to it but i think this is more about having that dh flexibility letting all of these young guys cook like so there'll be days where freeman and you know florio are playing there's days where yeah. arias is a dh there's probably more chances Jose of can dh which DH I think is a lot more yeah i think it's a lot of this isn't even necessarily about like manipulation of service time listen josh Taylor is going to miss a month at some point so that's when we'll see manzardo like he is just incapable of staying healthy for a season um so it's about that dh position it's about getting jose some more so it's not just service time money. service time service time is part of this but it's not it is just absolutely service time. no it, but it's I not think, only that yeah i think we are and here's the other reason why i think it's impossible to give josh Taylor an extension don't get me in trouble is i think we are moving closer and closer to jose ramirez as dh like that is part of the planning with that contract. Maybe. Yeah. We'll talk about that this week. We still have to yeah. do position previews. We'll get to those this week. We got to do our season predictions. I know Jeff mm-hmm. wants to do a college baseball and be draft update from the weekend was a big weekend for Travis Bazan and some other guys. We'll talk Condon, about that probably tomorrow. Anna, Condon, Burns, the, yeah. top, the top three have really established themselves. Yeah. A lot of interesting stuff happened over the weekend. So we'll talk about that probably tomorrow. We'll get to a position preview. And, of course, we will get to our season predictions this week as well. Real baseball finally starts on Thursday. It counts. I did hear there's a, some rain in the forecast Friday, so the Guardians might get their first doubleheader of the season on, on Saturday already. That could be tricky. We'll, we'll talk about that's, all that's that good this luck. week. 2022 was the year of the rain out. They had more rain outs than any year I can except ever for remember. The last week of the, except for the last series of the year when it wasn't good luck. Yeah. But but it, it, it held out until that last series. So I'm going to take that as a positive sign. I'm going to be positive. <laughs> Uh, thank you all for watch- watching, reading, reviewing, downloading. It helps. We hope you've enjoyed the show. If you are a new listener, remember to click subscribe. Thank you and go, go, go.